a world of farmer tan tourists in jab flip-flops and clip-on shades, a world of faces you loved for a week, for a weekend, or maybe just one starry, <coughs> sticky night. Myrtle Beach was all of that and then some. And for about 11 or 12 of us, it was home. <laughs> My friends, Dino Thompson. I figured that would tell you more about what it was like in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and it was a wonderful moment in time, the late 40s, 50s, early 60s. The world changed quite a bit in the late 60s and 70s. We grew up uh, pretty fast, uh, the ones who grew up downtown. Reuben and I, he was a paper boy. He, 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 he was working for Murphy, Murphy Cohen, who my dad used to say uh, taught all the paper boys how to throw the paper on the roof or in a mud puddle. <laughs> <clears throat> and he would come in the cozy corner when I was seven or eight, and he was seven or eight, and I'd give him a vanilla Coke and send him on the road and maybe a cheeseburger and a salty fries, you know, to go. But those were wonderful times uh, to grow up, it'll never happen again. We won't ever get back there again. Uh, the drug scene has changed a lot of the world uh, for many of us. Um, I remember we landed here. I don't remember that. But uh, I was four months old. We were on the way to Florida from Newport News. Mom and Dad were in a black LaSalle, 1940. I was in a bassinet in the back and everything they owned was stuffed in there and we were driving down 301, but back then there was no I-95. You had to get off somewhere around Wilmington on Ocean Highway 17, a two-lane two little highway. And so that's what we did and we came through Myrtle Beach and uh, it was about this time, it was end of October, everything was dead. Back then when people tell you things got slow, they didn't get slow, they stopped. <laughs> After Labor Day, they stopped. Everybody that was in business either had to borrow money or maybe they had saved enough to winter the weather, weather, to weather the winter, excuse me. And uh, I know Dad borrowed money every year We'd go, sometime I'd go with him and he'd say, sit on my lap, you know, it'd feel better <laughs> for me. You know. So, four or five, and I'm helping him borrow 5,000, you know, to get through the summer. And I remember years later when I first opened Cagney's and Dino's House of Pancakes in 1970, I had to borrow money every, every winter. And I remember I used to sit there. And they would say, how's your mama? How's your daddy? All this small talk. And all, all I wanted to say was, just give me the damn money and, <laughs> you know, don't put me through the torture of that. And I remember one of them would always say, and what's this for? What's this for? It's survival. And they would always write, renovation. <laughs> anyway, you used it to pay your light bill and pay your staff. But anyhow, we, uh, we stopped at the Cozy Corner Cafe. This little, this little restaurant right there. It's right downtown in the super block. The building's still there. And my dad, my mom and dad are both Greek. We walk in and there's nobody in there, but there's a Greek running it named Tom Haley. He grew up in Charleston. And he was a very dapper dude, French cuffs white and brown shoes, you know, a pin tie. And my dad wasn't quite that, he wasn't quite as fast talking as this guy. But anyway, he says, two Greeks, they start yapping. He says, we're on the way to Florida to find a life, find a business. And he says, well, I'll say the lease on this place, it's ready to go. Dad looks around and says, well, all I have is $3,200. And he said, that's the price. <laughs> 
And back then, you didn't need a lawyer, and we only had one lawyer in Myrtle Beach at the time. This is 1946, and we had one doctor, Dr. Rook. And uh, within two hours, they were shaking hands. He took a A&P bag, dumped some papers in there, emptied the cash drawer, put a 25 automatic in there, rolled it up, said good luck, and two hours later, Deb was introducing himself to the waitress and the cooks. I'm Tony, I'm the new owner. <laughs> and along with that lease, apartment one, went with the lease. This was my room. This was mom and dad's room. That's where I grew up. Right downtown Myrtle Beach. Right beside the cozy corner was Max 5 and 10. And then there was the uh, Broadway Theater, and then J&J &J Drugstore. And then there was another restaurant, and around the corner was Divine Sporting Goods, and upstairs was Dr. Joseph and the uh, AA room beside there. Across the street was Jake and Company. Looking out that window, I'm looking right at the amusement park and the ocean. So it was a fabulous place for a kid like me to grow up. So that was the beginning. And uh, we grew up fast downtown. Everybody that ran Myrtle Beach, the downtown boys, we had no knowledge of the northern people. What I mean is Pine Lakes, the Dunes <laughs> Uh, we, we didn't know what was going on up there. You know, we were downtown kids. South End boys. South End boys. We went to the pavilion every night. And in the summer, we all worked. Everybody, if you were more than three and a half feet high, you had a summer job. You were a carny or you were selling popcorn. or You were doing something for a tourist. So that, that was the beginning of uh, our lives. And... Reuben Hyman's mom helped raise me. She was one of the waitresses that worked with my family and became a close friend. And uh, she knew me when I was a baby. And when, when I was 15, she's working with me at the J Tree uh, Tea House, another restaurant my dad leased. He leased nine restaurants. He went out of business nine times. <laughs> we, we'd lease a place go out of business, we take the same chairs and tables, <laughs> put them in, change the menu, paint something, use different decor, a different dish, and we were a new place. We went from the cozy corner, I worked at the Fun Fair Grill, and then I worked at the J Tree Tea House, and then I worked at Caruso's Spaghetti House, and then I worked at the Imperial Lobster House, and then I worked at the uh, Diplomat Cafe, and then the 1956, uh, things were moving out of town, the suburbs became a word. So Dad leased a place called the Black Angus Steakhouse, where Friendly's is on 48th Avenue. And that was the ninth Holiday Inn of America in, in the United States. But Mrs. Smith on Ocean Boulevard already had the name before Holiday Inns were incorporated. So they couldn't call it Holiday Inn. They had that same big humpback sign that it was Holiday Lodge instead of Holiday Inns. But we were there for 15 years. And in the meantime, we leased several other places. But <clears throat> from there, I finally uh, went on my own 1970. I opened a pancake house up in North Myrtle Beach. And I opened the first one here while I was in college in uh, 1966, which was the first pancake house here. But I remember my first introduction to the northern kids was when mom decided to send me to kindergarten. And Mrs. Bradford would come and pick you up in some kind of big wagon and and take you to her house on, I can't remember what avenue it was on. And my mom dressed me like Lord Fauntleroy. <laughs> I had a cat, I had an Angora sweater, white shoes, 
white pants. I mean, I, I was a real fruity looking little kid. <laughs> and I grew up on the street, but here I am in kindergarten. And I got the hell beat out of me four or five days in a row. And I was small for my age. I'm still small. But I grew up on the streets. I was fighting hard as I could, but I was fighting some big kids. And so I remember rolling through some dirt with Rock Bradford and Neil Ammons, both the foot taller than me. And one of them started screaming, and I noticed that he had rolled through a bed of red ants. Oh. That was before fire ants, but back then red ants were the thing. They bit the hell out of you. So when I noticed him crying and running, I looked down at that little swarm and I thought, those are bad mammies. So I went inside, I knew my way around the kitchen, I got some Dixie cups, stirred them up, scooped them up and I tied the top. I did three cups of those, put them in my pocket. And from that day on, the next time somebody grabbed me, I'd pull their shirt out, pull down their shirt. And after about a month, everybody would say, don't mess with that little mother, he carries red hair. So I carried him uh, all the way to uh, first grade, second grade, <laughs> and it became, you know, I became dangerous for those things. A lot of people carried knives, but we didn't want to stick each other, but I would pour some ants on you. <laughs> now I remember, I'm going back now 50 years, and I get a call from someone named Sigmund Abelese. And you might remember him. He became a famous artist. He's about 88. And he's a renowned artist, and he left Myrtle Beach um, when he graduated high school and went to an Ivy League school. He was quite bright. His mother had a little guest house on the highway. And he calls me, and he says, uh, my name's Sigmund Abel. He's, uh, somebody sent me your book because they knew I graduated from Myrtle Beach High. And I read a story about you with red ants. Does a lot of people carry red ants in Myrtle Beach? And I said, I think I invented that. And he said, well, you may remember this, you may not, but the Todd brothers were beating the hell out of me right in front of the grammar school. I was about 14. And a seven or eight year old came by and they were on top of me and somebody poured red ants on both of them and told me to run. And we both ran, and I never knew who it was, and I said, that was me. <laughs> he said, so you rescued me. I said, yeah, they, they, they work no matter how old you are. <laughs> so anyway, that was our upbringing. You know, I mean, we, we went to the pavilion, we hung out, we learned how to dance early. My uncle, who was in 1953, 54, Jitterbug, South Carolina Jitterbug champion in Columbia. They used to have Jitterbug contests. They called it the Jitterbug back then. He um, he used to date uh, Vanna White's mom, and he would come to North Myrtle Beach where she grew up, and he would uh, mm -hmm. go to a. She was working at a, one of those places where you roll skate up to the car and wait on the. I forget the name of the little joint. But anyway, and then she would go borrow, borrow their father's car, and they would go from one dance joint to the other. Just both of them were really good dancers. And he was a cat. He had to pay pants. And he had his collar up, and that's why I still wear mine up. Had little skinny belts. And uh, I remember when I was about uh, seven or eight, the crowds used to be in the thousands watching the dancers at the pavilion, Myrtle Beach Pavilion. And there was always 10, 11 jitterbugs there, cats. They had the collar up and they were different from everybody. And they wore $75 pants in 1952, tailor-made, you know, with the seams down the side. And Nicky was standing there and he told me, um, that was my uncle, my mother's youngest brother, he said, um, if you ever come down here and you get in trouble, you run to him. And I looked over and it was 
His name was Maurice Treadway. He was only 135, 140 pounds. And I said, he's not as big as you. He said, yeah, but he's the best bare, <coughs> bare knuckle fighter in Orange County. He said he was a Golden Glove champion. So I said, okay. He said, or if he's not here, you run to him. And he shows me another 135 pounder with his collar up, leaning against the cheek box, cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And I said, well, he's even smaller. He said, yeah, but you see that thing he's cleaning his fingernails with? It was a switchblade. I said, yeah, but you carry a knife. He said, yeah, we all carry a knife. His name was Whitey Stevens. He said, they called him Blade. He said, but Blade will cut you. You go like this, and you lose a finger. He don't fight. He don't argue. You say something, he cuts you, and he walks away, and somebody will go, hey, you're bleeding. <laughs> and Whitey cut a lot of people. And to jump forward again, Harry Dreyer, one of the great, great shaggers and characters of all time, we were in Cagney's, and we were talking about Whitey, and I said, what about Whitey? Whatever happened to him? He's got to be dead. I'm sure somebody shot him. said, no, he's an evangelist. He does tent revivals. <laughs> well, go figure, you know. Anyway, uh, my mom and dad were 18-hour-a-day, uh, 365 days a year workers, like a lot of people. The... Uh, all the people that had those charming beach houses on the boulevard, they were all run by families. A lot of them lived there. And the motor courts on the highway, they were all charming places, wonderful places, all run by families. So everybody was a mom and pop. The first chain that came here was Howard Johnson's. And uh, somewhere in the early... 50s. The next chain that came was Schraff's. It had only lasted eight months. And my father leased that building and changed it to the Imperial Lobster House and made it fancy with a lobster tank, rolling prime rib cart, and he lasted a year. <laughs> but anyway, we, we never had a lot of money, but we always had a restaurant, we always had plenty to eat, and we always had somewhere to live. My mom would cry. And my dad would go, it's all right, I can, I was a peasant, I can go back to being a peasant. My mom would scream, I'm not going back to being a peasant. <laughs> she was a little more high maintenance. She had a charge account at uh, Helen Mates, and she had a charge account at John Baldwin's, and she dressed really good. And she was always, she always got first count at the register at the end of the night. If there was a hundred sticking under there, it was gone. <laughs> My dad, he could live on what a chicken kicked out of the, his coop. He, uh, he didn't demand much. The only thing he liked to do was hunt. He was not physical. He was not athletic. And, but he could be really funny. Uh, and I followed him around like a little puppy. But uh, I was always working the summertime. I had a lot of responsibility. When they opened the Black Angus, I was 10 years old. So now they had the cozy corner of the Black Angus. That was a much fancier, much more expensive place. So mom and dad were up there. They left me in charge of the cozy corner. I'm 10. <laughs> so I knew how to take cash already, and I knew how to see people. I knew how to bus tables. But he'd tell me what to do at the end of the night, and he left a great cook in there, Wild Bill Logan, and people like Ruben's mom, they knew how to run the dining room too. So I, I might seat you, I might bust the table, and then I'd take cash. At the end of the night, I'd make sure the back door was closed, and I'd make sure everything was, all the lights were out, and the cooks would take care of everything in the back, and people like Ruben's mom would make sure all the dining room stuff was done. And then I would turn all the lights out, and I would hide behind the counter. We had a big candy counter, and we had a magazine rack over there. And I would get about seven comic books, and I would use a flashlight, and I would hide there until Mom and Dad came to get me about 12.30. Mm -hmm. 
everybody says, well, that's child abuse. No, it wasn't child abuse. That's the way we grew up. They were trying to survive. So after about two weeks, my dad would come and he'd see me sitting in the dark, you know, with a light. He says, it's a little dangerous down here by yourself. So he sh gave me his 25 automatic <laughs> and he showed me how to take the safety off and how to point it. And he said, his hold seven shots. And I said, okay, so if someone breaks in, where do I shoot him? And he says, no, no, you don't shoot nobody. Shoot three times in the ceiling and run like hell. You're fast. You'll get away. <laughs> so that was the plan for about a year and a half. And then uh, he opened the Fun Fair Grill. I went there. And they opened uh, the J Tree. And I just kept following him around. My old man was quite a character. I remember one day he, he had one of the uh, greatest memories of all time. He read encyclopedias every night and I got my memory from him. I have a really ridiculously good memory. The people, he could be really funny, but uh, he knew history backwards and forwards. He was uncolleged, but he was extremely well read. I remember this one family came in and they were from Pennsylvania and he was a she was a teacher and he was a something. And they said, oh, we're thinking of uh, retiring and then open up a little diner down here. Could you show us your kitchen? And Dad said, certainly. So he's walking around and they're acting like all oh, this stainless steel is beautiful and they're rubbing things, you know, and feeling things. She looks at one of our three cooks and the one she looks at, John Lance, he had bad days. He drank the cooking sherry all day long, <laughs> and it was salty. He had days where he'd kick a cripple down a, a flight of stairs. Anyway, she says, do you love cooking? And he looks up and he says, how'd you like to cook the same damn thing 60 times a night? <laughs> and she said, she got the message and she moves over and she asks my dad another question. After about 10 questions, dad's had enough. And she says, well, what's it like? Is it hard? And dad says, everything's hard. Everything's hard. He says, I uh, swept floors in Athens. I stole eggs to live in Bulgaria. I dug up bombs and bodies at the, at the Battle of Verdun. He said, uh, and then I was a waiter in England, and I was a guide at the pyramids, and a camel's ass is very lumpy, and it's very hot. <laughs> had a straw hat, linen suit. He said, I got fired, uh, because after about six months, you're telling the same history of Giza and the pyramids. So I started making up some better stories. <laughs> He said, I threw a Greek pharaoh in there, and I thought a few wars that never happened, but they were very interesting. <laughs> he said, and then the head of the British Historical Society came through the group, and she went to the office afterwards and turned me in as the biggest liar in Egypt. <laughs> and I got fired and went back to England and became a waiter again. Anyway, so... She asked him another question, and he says, but what's it like? He says, you know, Prometheus <laughs> tricked Zeus and gave fire to the world. And Zeus was very mad. And he chained him to this mountain. And every day a giant eagle would come and tear his liver and eat it. And his liver would re rejuvenate. And then we'd come back the next day and the same thing and eat his liver again. And this woman's making a face and then she says, what, what does that have to do? He says, nothing. He said, but it's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> now, he was a cute guy. My mom was high energy. Dad, I think he was on Valium. My mom always needed one. So they were totally different, but they were married 56 years somehow, and uh, they, they were good to each other. I remember that uh, when we moved into the Cozy Corner, we were in apartment one. There was eight apartments up there. Apartment two 
there was a running poker game. I don't know who lived there, but there was always a poker game. 10 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night, different group, but there was always a poker game. So I was step and fetch it for the game, you know, I'm six, seven, and they tipped me. I'd make four or five dollars at six or seven, you know. Two fingers veal, and I'd run and get the illegal liquor and pour them two fingers veal, you know. <laughs> two fingers ouzo, and I'd get the ouzo. So I was the bartender, I'd go downstairs. <laughs> Something to eat, so that meant, if you're Greek, that meant you go down and you get a platter of cheese and olives and tomatoes and radishes and onions, and, you know. So there was a guy I used to call Uncle Andrew. He dressed like the Duke of Windsor, spiffy dresser. He didn't have a dime. But I mean, he... I mean, he looked beautiful all the time. And Dad said he drank a bottle of uh, of, of uh, scotch every day, and I thought, that's a lot. So there was a big couch there, and a lot of times somebody would be playing, and he'd take a nap, get up, keep playing. So Uncle Andrew, he wasn't a real uncle. I called him uncle because he gave me a silver dollar occasionally. I'm leaning against him like this. He's, he's laying like this. I'm kind of leaning in the middle of him. His, head, his head's over there. And I look at his head, and he just looks weird. <laughs> and I said, uh, hey, Dad. And he says, wait a minute, son. Call $2. Raise $2. I said, Dad. He says, wait a minute. Wait till the hand's over. So the hand's over, and I said, Uncle Andrew don't look good. He said, uh, it's all right. He's he's winning. <laughs> Cadillac Joe was playing his hand. He said he's winning forty some dollars, and I said, "But he don't look good." He had some crud around his mouth, and I said, "Dad." And finally, Cadillac Joe he puts his hand on me. He says, "You know, he don't look good because he's dead." <laughs> I remember I, I jumped off I jumped off the couch, and my dad puts me back, and he said, "Uncle." Andrew loved you. I said, he's really dead? He says, yeah, but nobody was moving, nobody was doing nothing. They said, but he's a lucky, excuse my language, but occasionally you have to tell the word. He says, he's a lucky son of a bitch. <laughs> and I'm thinking, he's dead? He's lucky? He says, yeah, he's winning. He's never been married. He's got no house, no children. He's a lucky son of a bitch. <laughs> so, at about seven, I realized that was the definition of lucky son of a bitch. You're winning, you've got no house, no children, no wife. So anyway, about uh, 45 minutes on, Deputy Sheriff comes in. He was one of the players. He, he sits down, he looks over there, and he says, uh, She did? And everybody nods. He said, uh, Y'all need to call somebody. He's getting a little loud, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so they called Winstead's funeral home. Winstead owned a uh, furniture store and a funeral home. I guess he made the damn caskets, too. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, here comes somebody with a gurney up the steps. It was a bunch of steps, and they had to turn right. It's, you know, small apartments. They're trying to get... Nobody gets up. Everybody's just doing like this, and they're pulling him off the couch, and they get him on the gurney, and they, they take him, and that night we had a, a thing for him in the cozy corner, you know, they, the Greeks always like to have some fried fish and stuff, and everybody just tells stories about Andrew, and I heard the word, lucky son of a bitch, about 22 times. <laughs> but that was my old man, and uh, he had a wonderful life, and... Uh, I had a lot of responsibility at a very young age, but I still had two lives. By the time I was 15, I started to play some poker because I grew up around it. It didn't seem alien to me. And then I had a date. My dad had a little Willie's Jeep, Army Jeep, and he kept two dogs in it all the time. They lived there. So I had to, I got a date with a girl who was actually 18. I told her I was 17. I was 15. <laughs> I was very excited about this. She was from Albemarle. And I cleaned the Jeep out with, with as, as, as well as I could. 
and she was kind of prissy, but it was okay. Well, there was a lot of holes in there because they would just hose it out, you know, occasionally. There was a lot of rust holes in there. They were small, though. So I covered them up with tape and uh, kind of made it look like a uh, bass outlet thing, you know. And her foot went through <laughs> one of the holes and it caught her about here, top of the knee, and that rusty metal wouldn't let her foot come back up. I kept trying to pull her and she kept screaming. She was not very happy about this and uh, so then I had to walk about a half a mile to Hoyt's, Hoyt Richardson's uh, gas station and borrow a flashlight and some snips. And I told him what was going on. He says, you want me to come? I said, no. So he gave me a ride back. So I got under the Jeep and she kept saying, are you looking up my skirt? And of course I was looking up her skirt. I couldn't possibly <laughs> not look up her skirt and cut the metal. And she uh, said I'd ruined her rocket career and she couldn't dance a damn lick. She was never going to be a <laughs> rocket. That was my first car date. <laughs> the next time I got a older woman date, I went to the um, Flamingo Drive-In on the north end of town. And back then you didn't care what the movie was, you just went to the drive-in. <laughs> And The Hustler was playing with Paul Newman, and I ended up watching it. It was a fantastic movie, you know. And the next day, I went straight to the pool hall. I'd never been in the pool hall. And the guy running it was named Gene Todd. Everybody called him Yaw Gene. So I walk right in, strut right in, and he stops me. He just puts his hand out and says, Son? It stops me, and I said, Yes, sir. He says, uh, he points at a sign that says you have to be 16 years or older or have permission from your father. So he said, how old are you? I said, I'm, a, I'm 16. <laughs> but I, I forget, uh, I just turned 16. I told him I was 15. I said, I'm really 16, but I'm only been three days. And he looked at me, he said, that ain't no flush. He made me leave. So I went straight to the dime store and I I got a uh, piece of line paper, a number two pencil, and an envelope, and I wrote in Greek <coughs> that I had permission to come in, and I signed it, my dad's Greek name, and I brought it back, and he opened it up, and he said, what the heck is this here? And I said, well, that's Greek. He said, well, who's your daddy? And I said, Tony Thompson. He said, your daddy's Tony? To go to the corner? I said, yeah. He said, come on in, son. <laughs> It took me 10 years to get out of there. <laughs> after football practice, straight to the pool hall. After basketball practice, straight to the pool hall. And not a good place to be, but I still had my responsibilities, but I was leading two lives for quite a while, my low life and my high life. <laughs> and I remember one day, I was there about 11.30, and Mr. Hussey, from Hussey Motors, one of our finest gentlemen. He was also the head of the Gideons. He, he stopped me on the way out and he said, son, I want to talk to you. And he had a Bible and he had several passages underlined. And he opened it up and he said, I want you to read this passage. And I don't want to see you back here on a school night again. He said, I want you to think about what you're doing with your life. I didn't know what to say, but I said, thank you, sir. And I took the Bible, and I took about five steps. And I turned around, I said, Mr. Hussey, can you wait about five years to save me? I'm unsavable right now. <laughs> and he looked at me like two horns jumped out of my head. And he went to take the Bible. I said, I'd be glad to keep the Bible. He said, no, you won't. And he just snatched it away from me. About three nights later, I was in there, it was about 11 o'clock, and he used to work late, and he'd come in, get a hot dog and a Pepsi, and he looked over at me, and I waved, and he just shook his head. And he used to come in the restaurant, and I'd, I'd remind him about that, and he said, well, you turned out all right. <laughs> and I'll tell you one more story, and then I'll ask 
if anybody has any questions. My dad, uh, when I was about 14 or 15, after running several restaurants, I became a genius, and I knew a lot more than he did in everybody else in the restaurant. And I remember I said, uh, you don't know how much you make. He said, what do you mean? I said, you count the register like a blind man feeling somebody's face. He said, but I get close. I said, you put the bills all in a big bucket. People have to come and ask you for their money. He says, I take one out every month, and the lucky one get my send a check. He says, I, I pay him. I said, that's not how to run. I said, do you know how much you make? And he said, son, you need to relax. Go eat something. And, and I was just on a roll. I was telling him how, literally, how dumb he was. And he smiled. He never got mad. He'd always give me some sort of thing about Diogenes. Or <laughs> so he says, uh, okay, go get a pencil and paper. I'm thinking, well, he's coming around. So I got a pencil and paper. And he says, uh, write down how much your mother spends on those hairdos every week. I said, what? He says, write down. Fifteen dollars? Right. How about those shoes she buys from uh, John Baldwin's in that? He says, write that down. And those dresses, and she's got a lot of lipstick. So write down how much I spent on shotgun shells and feeding the dogs and gas for the Jeep. And write down how much you spent on those fancy paint pants. And he says, and he named about ten more things. And I said, what is all that? He says, that's how much we made. <laughs> he says, now, well, go back to work. <clears throat> And this will be the last Tony story. I used to ask him what was the best this and the best that. And he never committed to anything. What's your favorite food? You know, when you're 13, 14, you like those kind of questions. Who's the prettiest woman? You know, Lola Bridget or Grace Kelly, you know, Marilyn Monroe. They're all beautiful. What do you want if you was your last meal? He says, I like everything. And that's the way he answered everything. Who are you going to vote for? I don't know. Nobody's any damn good. <laughs> so I remember I was on another roll, and I kept asking questions. So he said, get in the Jeep. We're going to go pick some stone crabs. So we went down the 2nd Avenue Pier. The rocks used to show down on 2nd Avenue Pier, and you could grab a stone crab out, pop a claw, put it in a bucket. We had about 15 claws, and then he said, let's walk up on the pier and see if somebody threw an octopus away. Nobody ate octopus back then. Dad ate octopus. He'd take it to the restaurant, and I'd have to beat the damn thing for an hour on a butcher block so you could eat it. So when we were walking down the pier, so I said, well, I knew a question to ask. He was gonna, I knew what the answer was going to be. I said, what's the best day of your life? I know he's going to say, I'm an only child. I know he's going to say, the day I had a son. And he got a whimsical look. He looked across the horizon. And he says, oh yeah, I remember that. Yes, I remember that. I said, what was it? He says, um, I was asleep. He says, um, it had been 12 days and nights. He said, uh, we were crammed all down, eight, nine hundred of us in steerage. He said, um, and people started screaming like a stew of languages, in different languages. My father spoke five languages. And he said, uh, they were screaming, uh, the lady, the lady. And he said, I rubbed the porthole. And it was foggy, and I looked out, and I saw the Statue of Liberty. He said, yes, that's the greatest day of my life. I'll never have another day like that. And I remember staring at him for minutes, thinking, damn, I don't think I'll ever have a day like that, ever. You know, you can't, you can't put yourself there. But he was one of the uh, 22 million who came through Ellis Island. He came through in 1929, and he uh, worked and got his 
citizenship. He knew history quite well, so it didn't take him long to learn about the United States. And he was very, but that day, I never forgot that day, every now and then I'd look at him and I'd think, he's not so cool, but yet, that was the coolest damn day he'd ever told me about, you know, I knew I'd never have a cooler day than that. So that was the old man, that was mom, and that was our growing up. If uh, any of y'all have questions about the back or uh, long ago, I'd be glad to try and answer one. Dino, I was wondering if you could share your recollections of the Ocean Forest Hotel and also Charlie's Place. Sure. <coughs> uh, during the winter, when things were dead, I wasn't required to work in the restaurant so much. So I got a job. Dad would drop me off at the Ocean Forest. I was a bellhop. And I'm um, little black pants, bow tie, little white jacket. And I waited on quite a few celebrities there when they were having the theater. They had That was the only theater in the round on the East Coast. Um, and quite a number of famous movie stars came through there. I, I personally waited on to Little Bankhead, Zsa Zsa, um, Veronica Lake, Diana Barrymore, John Payne, John Ireland, Tuesday Weld. I was about 11 and she was 16. I thought I had a chance with her. <laughs> she was really cute. <laughs> Bert Lahr was there. And I would take, sometimes I would take room service too. I was a bellhop, take room service. And you made a quarter, you know, you made, a sandwich was 45, 50 cents, so you didn't make a lot of money. So I remember I took a, a club sandwich, two club sandwiches to the room, and Diana Barrymore, and I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this, is standing in front of a mirror, naked, and she's got her hands over her breast and a little towel right here. So I'm about 11, so I'm trying to concentrate on this tray I have. <laughs> and I set it down. Back then you couldn't just drop the tray, you had to set the napkin down and you had continental service everything and make it look nice. So I'm standing there and she's smiling. and So I got it all down there and she gave me a five dollar bill. Under the sheets was somebody, somebody was moving under a sheet over there. <laughs> And there was a big bottle of liquor there. All the paramours drank pretty well. <coughs> anyway, hang on just a second. So uh, that night I went home and I was counting my money out and I usually had two, three, four dollars. But I had about nine or ten dollars because I had a five dollar bill there and my dad walks by with his player cigarette and says, who the hell did you rob? <laughs> and I said, a woman gave me five dollars and she was buck naked. And he said, he didn't know what buck naked man. I said, she was naked. She had nothing on. He said, what the hell kind of place is that? The next time that woman calls, you call me and I'll take the room. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it was the ocean forest, the history of the ocean forest. I could spend two hours talking about the uh, tragic history, but it was our jewel at the time, you know. We gave directions by the ocean forest. It's a mile north, it's two miles south. Everything was centered around the ocean forest hotel. And it should have been renovated, we all know that. And it could have been renovated because the people who demolished it, I had leased the land for Cagney's when I was a junior in college. But I didn't have enough money to get a loan to build the place. But I had that empty lot. There was a big hole in it from where they had built the highway. They had had a big hole. And I had gotten a bid of $35,000 worth of dirt. I didn't have 3500 This six foot five man walks in the pancake house. I had built the pancake house by then, but still couldn't get a loan for Cagnes. Was in the middle of nowhere. It was too big. I'm too young. And this big six foot five man walks in and says, you got a hole up there. I'm going to fill it up for you. And I said, really? 
I said, with what, stumps? And he said, no, I'm going to fill it for a broken brick and uh, concrete, and I'm going to grade it to your specifications, and when I leave, you're going to say I'm one fine SOB. That's what he said. And he laughed, and I said, why are you going to do that for me? He said, well, I'm going to demolish the ocean forest. I've got a contract. I couldn't believe it. I said, really? He said, yeah. No one knows it, but I've got a... This can save me several hundred thousand dollars. I have to drive 35 miles one way to dump all the material and back. It'll save my trucks wear and tear, time, labor. I, I couldn't believe it. He ended up telling me that it was the finest constructed building he'd ever examined. He had demolished um, over 300 high-rises. And he said it would last a thousand years. You need to gut it make the rooms bigger, the lobby smaller, the outside just needs some TLC. Anyway, he explained that uh, it was worth renovating. And it could have been our breakers, our green dyer. It, you know, it, it could have, could have, would have. But um, when other people tell you it was sinking or it was this, that's not true. This man examined it totally. He said it, would, it hadn't sunk a half an inch. But they were using that excuse to justify tearing it down because they couldn't make the payments. So they were going to sell everything out of it and try to make the payment and still keep the land. But uh, about eight months after they tore it down, they still lost the land and went back to the bank. But that's the tragic part of the ocean forest. And he wanted me to mention Charlie's place. Charlie Fitzgerald was the owner of Charlie's nightclub, restaurant, motel, and a cab company. A very substantial businessman, black or white. And he was at night dressed to the nines. And during the day, if you went by his place, first time I ever saw a man, he had overalls in on and a white shirt buttoned at the top. And his overalls were starched. And I was, I mean starched. And I was thinking, damn, you cut cheese with those creases. <laughs> but we got to know Charlie as a young child because my dad would put everybody, at, back then hardly anybody had cars. So at the end of the night, we had several black staff, wonderful people. Dad would pile them all up and we'd take them out to the hill, which was color town back in the day. And they, the, the black community supplied 80-90% of the workforce for the hospitality industry in Myrtle Beach. So we owe them a great deal of that. So Deb would always stop by Charlie's place and have an illegal drink with him. And while he did that, I would go play pinball machines, you know, wander around the room. And when I got big enough, when we were driving out there, I would see signs on the post that Amos Melbourne's coming and Big Joe Turner's coming. I knew all these people because we had black uh, Negro music on our jukeboxes, on our white jukeboxes at the pavilion and all our juke joints. That's where the term beach music came. Beach music meant it was the music, it was black music. It was the black forbidden music that you could hear on Myrtle Beach in Ocean Drive jukeboxes that you couldn't hear in Ohio and West Virginia and Tennessee because it wasn't allowed. It wasn't played on the radio, it wasn't allowed on the white jukeboxes. But on our jukeboxes, it was a lot of black music. Why? Because it was danceable. It had a rhythmic dance backbeat. And if it had a backbeat, we wanted it. We bought it and we wanted it. Now Charlie, the greatest music on earth was being heard at Charlie's place. I saw Amos Melbourne there. I saw Big Joe Turner. I saw Little Richard when I was 10 years old. Dad didn't know who Little Richard was, so he had an act at, at 10.30. So I told Dad I was going to see Little Richard. He said, okay. He thought I was spending the night with Little Richard. <laughs> I got on my bike, it was about six or seven blocks, and um, 
he made two of the cooks walk with me. And I went in, the place is packed, Carver Street is jumping, and I walk in and uh, Miss Sarah sees me and says, what are you doing? I want to see uh, Little Richard. So Miss Sarah was Charlie's wife, beautiful lady. And she, she puts me on the end of the stage and Little Richard danced all over me. <laughs> and at 12.30, she took two of the guys from the club and made them walk with me while I rode my back, bike back to the cozy corner. Dad's upstairs in the apartment. When I called the board, he said, I thought you were spending the night. I said, no, I went to see Little Richard. He played the piano with his, with his elbows and his feet and his head. <laughs> Dad says, what the hell's wrong with that man? He's got no hands. <laughs> so I, there was no sense in explaining. I just went to bed. But, but Charlie Fitzgerald, uh, what was interesting about him, he, he was the only place in Myrtle Beach in the Green Book. If you all don't know what the Green Book is, Google it and learn about it. The Green Book was the black family's guide in Bible for how to travel in the United States. It told you every town where you could get a haircut, where you could eat, where you could sleep. And people would use that to travel. And Charlie's motel was in it. And when he had a black family, he would send a black family to the cozy corner in the 40s, 15 years before the Greensboro sit-in. It was no big deal. Nobody threw rocks through a window. You get a lot of funny looks when somebody come in and see a black family sitting there. But Charlie also ate with my dad two, three times a week. And 40 feet down the street is the Broadway Theater. Charlie sat in the white section, second row against the wall, always. Me, I would sneak upstairs past Pops, the guy who took up tickets. He would fall asleep about 10 minutes after the <laughs> movie started, and I'd sit in the black section. Because they could talk up there, nobody ever said anything. And they would, they just had this, thing where, you know, Lash LaRue's got the gun on somebody and somebody's sneaking up behind him to knock him out, and they go, Lash, Lash, he's behind you. <laughs> now, if we did this downstairs, the ushers would throw us out. I mean, you could not talk downstairs, but, so I always enjoyed sitting up there. And, I hate to admit this, but they taught me how to do some awful things to people below. <laughs> I'm not, my wife will be embarrassed if I tell all those stories. But uh, this is kind of gross. It's one of the funniest things I remember. There was one fellow up there. He was arguing all the time. They were arguing about who was the fastest, Mickey Mantle. And, well, they were arguing about everything. Whose horse was the fastest? Who could outshoot Lash LaRue or Cisco Kid? So they're arguing, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, Woodrow says, Hey, no, they don't. Look at this. And I look, and he's got a booger on the end of his finger. <laughs> and I look, and you know, you could see the screen behind it. It looked like a cattle pillow. And he said, you see that? You can rob a bank with that. <laughs> I, I, never, I never forgot that, and I thought, I think he's right. You can rob a bank with that. <laughs> but here's me sneaking up to the black section. Charlie Fitzgerald's sitting in the white section. Black people are sitting in my dad's restaurant in the 40s and 50s. And that was the way it was. White kids are going to Charlie's nightclub. Every now and then somebody didn't like my face there. Somebody drinking too much and getting my face. But Miss Sarah would always come up to me and she said, I know you're feisty, they told me. But don't you ever start a fight in here. I said, yes ma'am, never. She's, you know, the last thing she needed was some little white kid getting his butt kicked in a black nightclub. So every now and then somebody would be talking to me, I'd be leaning back. But Robert Gore, six foot five, 280 pounds, he'd pick him up by the armpits and just drag him out, throw him off the porch, and Miss Sarah say, you all right? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. 
And that happened a few times, but usually everybody was just honored that I'm there, glad I'm there, ha happy I'm there. And I took my friends there. I took several people there, and we watched, like I say, Ruth Brown, Charles Brown, Jerry Butler, uh, Big Joe Turner. And there was this one instance where somebody got right in my face, and he was talking, and he was spitting when he was talking. He was quite drunk. And I shoved him back, and he took a swing and kind of went off the top of my head. So I got up. Miss Miss Sarah's running. Two or three of the the black doormen are running. Oh my God, Dino was about to get in a fight in the middle of the club. They got him locked up. They're dragging him back, and he's saying he's calling me chicken. Several times he said that. He says, you chicken something. You're hiding under Miss Sarah's skirt. You're hiding under Miss Sarah's skirt. So I stood up and I said, Miss Sarah, let's just take him out behind there. Nobody will know. And just let him and me finish it. Nobody will ever know. Nobody's going to see nothing. She looks at me. I said, he said I was hiding under your skirt. And she said, he said that? I said, yes, ma'am. So he told Robert, he says, check him, and he had a big knife. That would have spoiled my day. <laughs> they took the knife off of their search, and they took us out back. And the dance is going on. People are dancing and having a good time. And uh, he was real drunk. He took a roundhouse swing, and I stepped inside and popped him three times. And uh, Miss Sarah said, fight's over. It's over. I said, yes, ma'am. And then she pulled it. She had a beautiful, flowery long skirt, I remember, and she pulls her skirt up, and there's a little pistol tied to her. <laughs> she says, this is what hides under my skirt next time you deal with me. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, well, that's... <laughs> so I was very impressed with Miss Sarah's... Uh... Now, Charlie used to carry a 32 pearl handle pistol, and he'd come in the cozy corner with that. And on several occasions, when I'm four, five, six, I'd have my guns on, you know, my cowboy <laughs> outfit on. And I'd see he had a pistol, too. And I'd say, you got a pistol, too? And he'd laugh. And I'd say, can I see it? And he'd take the bullets out of it. And I'd put it in the holster. And I'd run down the street and kill several people and come back and <laughs> put the bullets back. And, but he always carried that pistol. And, of course, many of you might know the, the terrible story of the Klan. It's not, it's, it's what I call the uh, black murder in our history, um, where the uh, Klan came parading through 1950 in August, and 26 carloads came parading through. They, have been, they paraded through Conway two weeks before done the same thing. And now they're coming through Myrtle Beach. And I remember, it was nighttime, we had customers in the restaurant, and I remember my mother was crying, because if you know anything about the Klan, they don't like immigrants, they don't like Catholics, they don't like Jews, they don't like anybody but who they consider themselves. So I remember, I'm looking in the window, and Dad pulls me down, my mother's crying, some of the customers are actually on the floor. Because it was frightening, 26 car loads, many of them walking beside the car, shouldering weapons. And the lead car, you know this when you're a kid, because Continental is an unusual car. It had a four-foot welded angle iron cross welded to the bumper, and it was punched out with red lights. It was a scary-looking thing. And uh, he was the Grand Dragon. He was from Leesville, South Carolina. Thomas Hamilton, a jerk. And uh, most of those people were from out of town. There were several from Conway. There were no Myrtle Beach people in that crowd that night. But there were several from Conway. You can look up their names. They became quite well-known citizens. <coughs> and so they went up, and then they turned left down. 10th Avenue and they went down Carver Street and they scared everybody and they just drove past 
and then they went up to Atlantic Beach, scared the hell out of everybody, just the side of them and scattered people. And then they went somewhere out in Loris and stopped. Now during this time, several of the younger blacks and older blacks in the Carter Street community got guns and they came back to Charlie's place. Well, Charlie knew the sheriff quite well, Sheriff Sasser. He was a good man. He was not a Klansman. He was not a sympathizer. He was a good guy. He had a lot of courage. Anyway, but he knew Charlie well. And Charlie called him and said, tell those boys they had their fun, but not to come back. There might be bloodshed. Now that was supposedly the exact words of Charlie, but the the radio call was on the desk was heard by a couple deputies, and one of the deputies was a Klan sympathizer, so he radios the Grand Dragon who had a radio car himself, and tells them, not the same way, those ends dared your asses to come back said there might be, you know. It, you tell a bunch of drunks now, you know, you dare them to come back, and they did. They turned around, came all the way back, they parked in front of Charlie's place. The paper said they shot from 300 to 600 shots into the club. Now, these are all good old boys. Everybody down here grows up hunting. I'm sure every darn one of them could shoot. So they weren't aiming at people, or they could kill a hundred people that night. But they were shooting the place up, emptying their guns, shooting the place up. The only person that was killed was a Klansman. Now nobody knows who killed him. I told you, Charlie carried a pistol. And some people say that when he saw the Klan drive up, he walked out on the porch with two pistols. That was one of the stories. I've heard different versions. Could have been Charlie, could have been somebody else. But one of the Klansmen was shot dead in the parking lot in his sheets, uh, his Percal sheets. And uh, when they undressed him, uh, he was an Ory County policeman, and he had just been elected magistrate. He was the magistrate-elect. His name was Johnson. And when we did a documentary on Charlie's place and we had the premiere showing of it, <coughs> his family came to that. I thought his entire family, his children, uh, came to that. Of course, they weren't Klansmen, but their dad was, you know, and he was killed as a Klansman. And they kind of met everybody and shook hands with everybody there, black and white. I thought that was quite... Uh, elegant of them to, to come to that. And also Sheriff Sasser's children came to that too. Y'all might, if you haven't seen it, it's on Carolina Stories. It's called Charlie's Place. 30 minute documentary on Charlie's Place. You might find it interesting. But anyway, Charlie was overwhelmed, put in the back of a trunk, put in a trunk, driven out to somewhere Highway 501 in the woods, tied to a tree and beaten really badly. And uh, he was left, left there, maybe left for dead, but he was beaten badly, wasn't killed, wasn't shot or stabbed, he was just beaten. They all left, he slowly got loose, wandered to the highway, somebody picked him up, took him to Dr. Chapman. Dr. Chapman worked on him, called Dr called Sheriff Sasser. Sheriff Sasser took him and hid him in his basement house that night because he thought maybe they're looking for him. He can identify these people. And uh, after two days, he got two of his deputies to drive him to the hospital, the prison hospital in Columbia, not to put him in prison, but to protect him and for him to uh, get more care. Nobody knows how long he was there exactly. I've asked many people, but he ended up going north, kind of left town for a while, which was 
and he went to uh, some say Philadelphia, he went to New York. Some people say he was from that area. Thurgood Marshall interviewed him. J. Edgar Hoover interviewed him. Um, Strom Thurmond was a governor. He condemned it to high hell. Uh, I know that sounds ironic, but he did. And um, about five or six months later, we had heard they'd cut his ears off. It's a hor horrible thing to think about. But they didn't. The Klan likes to mark you sometime. They'll cut you somewhere. They cut his ear loops off. Well, he walks in the cozy corner. I'm about this big. And I remember when he walked in, everybody was surprised. And he looked fine. And everybody said hello to him. And all the kibitzers, Greeks, Jews, Lebanese used to sit around, Baptists shooting the breeze. They all knew Charlie. He was one of the kibitzers. And I remember I'm walking around and I'm staring at his ears, you know, <laughs> looking like this. He swoops me up and he says, you looking at my ears, boy? And I said, no, sir, no, sir. <laughs> he said, I got ears. And he did. He had ears. You know, you couldn't see what had happened to him. And he lived to fight another day. He died about five and a half years later. And Miss Sarah ran the club for another 15 years or so and ran it uh, like male royalty. She was beautiful. She was a mulatto lady, but she was gorgeous and a classy lady. And then when integration set in for good, uh, the club finally, you know, you could go to the beach club to see Amos Melbourne instead of where the only place you could go back then was Charlie's place to see a great black musician and artist. But Charlie, uh, Charlie was uh, was a cat. He, um, I remember Leroy Brunson, a good friend of mine. He, uh, his father used to work with my father, one of the best men I've ever known, best grown man in the history of the world, Wild Bill Logan. Leroy, Leroy and I were eating lunch about. 10, 12 years ago, and we started telling Charlie Fitzgerald stories. And he lived right across the street from Charlie's place. And when the Klan came, his mother put them under the stoop. But him and his brother made them, you know, all the houses had a stoop back then, you know. They were built up like this. He said they crawled. So they were sitting there watching the whole thing. I mean, he was, he was a witness to the entire thing. Leroy said, uh, we were playing baseball one day on Carver Street, sent about 15 head of us. And somebody came running down from 10th Avenue. We saw him running and hollering, running and hollering. He finally got to us, which was about 15th Avenue. And he said, uh, Charlie's sitting down eating. Charlie's sitting down eating. And Leroy said, all of us went, all 15 of us threw our gloves down, started running. We followed him all the way down to your daddy's place. And Charlie was sitting with your daddy eating a sandwich. He said there was some lightning on the windows and we couldn't see but the top of his head. So we took turns picking each other up to actually see that he was sitting down eating. And Leroy said, you know, he was just a child of 10 or 11. He said, that's the damnedest thing I ever saw. He said, black man sitting down eating with a white man in a white man's restaurant. He said, I never forgot that. We all went back and said, we're going to start working, get us enough money, we'll come down here and get us a sandwich. <laughs> you know, and I remember thinking about that, uh, that story, you know, no way for a old white boy like me to totally relate to it, but I often think about the uh, impact of that for somebody like Lee Roy, a young, young black kid. But um, Charlie left quite a legacy of music and history, cultural legacy, and uh, so did his wife, Miss Sarah. So we, we were lucky enough to uh, save his house and the office and half of the motel. The club is gone. But um, 
a lot of people need to know this story, not not because of the Klan story. Everybody's always wants to dwell on that. But even after the Klan story, I mean, I went th I went to Charlie's place 40 or 50 times. I took different kids with me. Nothing ever happened. Uh, everybody took care of us. Uh, the only time there was ever a fight was when I made Miss Sarah take us around the building. She should have just shot the guy. I didn't know she was back in you. Know. But uh, that, that's quite a history. Now the Ocean Forest is another history they could talk about forever. But uh, I'm going to stop there. And if anybody else has a question, Dino, before anyone ever walks out of here, please give us a plug on your new book. Um, this is called this is called Cluster Forks. <laughs> it's only about the restaurant business in my 50, 60 years, you know. Of, uh, and I don't write about the nine or ten million really nice people that I've served. <laughs> I write about the couple thousand crazy SOBs. <laughs> Some of them I had to physically remove, fight, uh, cuss out, throw out, you know. And the stupid customer comments, you know, that's what you write about. You know, you're not going to write about all the friends I've made over the years. That's not what this is. This is, once you read this, if you've ever thought about opening a restaurant, read it again. <laughs> Where is it available? Well, I, it's so big, I, I printed it myself. <laughs> no one's going to publish this book. You know, it's, it's the Bible, and bigger than the Bible. And uh, I just have it at the restaurant. Uh, I only printed 1,500 copies because it's I, every book I sell, I'm going to lose money. But I didn't write it for that. You know, I didn't write it to make money. I knew I was going to lose it. I just thought that uh, my restaurant histories, a lot of it needs to be told. So it's in there. But cluster forks. When you have a cluster, you know what in the restaurant? It's a cluster fork. <laughs> Yes. Yes. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you might be right there. I mean, uh, that was the first naked woman I saw, and I, it was worthwhile. She was quite voluptuous. <laughs> yes? I just thought maybe you could segue into the effect of Susan Corbett in the Beach Club oh. and as a segue into the Charlie's Club. Like well, the, beach, the Beach Club opened in 61. It closed in 71. It opened with Bo Diddley. It closed with um, Frankie Valley. But Places like the Beach Club are what closed, slowly closed Charlie's Place. Now some of the black, great black musicians are coming to white venues. But um, Cecil and Charlie Corbett ran the place and they sold hot 25 cent paps beer in a paper cup. <laughs> and um, if you order the beer, you got a paps. 25 cent. And if you were if you were tall enough to put it on the counter, Miss Corbett would give you a beer. <laughs> and it was a great, it was a great place to go. We all went there, and uh, it sounds like it because I gambled quite a bit, and I went to a lot of bad places, uh, pool rooms and poker places. But I only got drunk once in my life, and that was at the beach club. Some of our friends. Timmy Taylor, Tony Kobe, D.H. Baum, we called him. He used to wear his pants up to here. <laughs> they mixed up something they called daiquiris. You know, we were 15, and a, a daiquiri recipe was two quarts of grain alcohol and some lime juice. <laughs> and you don't taste the grain alcohol 
And so I had a, about a milkshake cup and a half of that, and I was drunk as hell. And I was with a really cute gal who was a flirt, and she just couldn't help herself. She bat her eyes at somebody, and uh, they'd want to come over and talk to her. And then when they got too close, she'd go, Dino, they're bothering me. And when you go over and say, she's with me, well, you're in a fight. You know, they go, eh. you know, they tell you something and you'd say something. You're in a fight. Well, I was drunk. And these two rednecks from Taylor City were bothering her. And I remember, I could fight. I knew how to fight. But this guy hit me two or three times and I didn't see any of them. And I'm thinking, I, I am drunk. <laughs> so I remember I backed up again and he took a swing. And I, I was trying to fight and I couldn't fight. I got popped couple more times and the fight was finally over. We go outside, we're trying to get in the car and the car is stuck. Timmy Taylor's Nash is stuck. He had a, he had a, a, a hanger on it. This door didn't open and this door kept flying open so he had a hanger <laughs> hooked to that door so this door wouldn't fly open. But anyway, we were stuck and we were trying to get it out. And here comes these two rednecks again. And, and, and uh, Rosalind and their girlfriend are sitting on a stump waiting on us. And these two same guys show up. And she hollers, Dana, they're bothering me again. I'm going, oh my God, that's the same guy that just kicked my butt. So I walk over and I said, that's enough for tonight. So I, I thought, well, we're going to fight again. So I got my little stance. And he said, no, we're not going to fight this time. And he pulls a big knife out, a big buck knife. So I said, I thought we were going to fight. He said, no, I'm just going to cut you up now. <laughs> so I remember I backed up about four steps, and I stepped on a log, not a stick. It was a log. It was this big. So I, thought, I picked it up, and I went in berserk mode, started swinging and screaming. And I scared him so bad he fell down, and I walked him about four or five times with it. And here comes the one policeman of the beach club, Mr. Hux, Barney Fife of the beach. <laughs> he arrests me. <laughs> well, I'm beating the guy with a with the log. You know, it started feeling good about the fourth time. <laughs> so he arrests me and I said, tell him, this guy pulled a knife on me. By that time, he, he's taken off and they're gone. Gone back to Tabor City. He used to call it Razor City. Because everybody up there, when you're eight or nine, they give you a knife. <laughs> anyway, they finally straightened it out and let us go home. But that was, I swore I'd never be drunk again, and I have never been drunk again. Because um, if I had, I would have never made it out of a lot of the places I went, you know, rough places. But that was my one beach club memory. Um, it was a good one. And Rosalind, she doesn't mind me telling that story. She's a beautiful girl. But she said, I was not a flirt. Yes, you were. <laughs> yes. I was wondering how much of L.A. Merle Beach was from the Greens. When we came here, we stopped. Dad started chatting with um, the owner of the place, Tom Haley. My dad's Tony Thompson, he's Greek, and he's Tom Haley, he's Greek. My dad changed his name in the army because it didn't fit on his name tag. Uh, and so the first question, uh, dad asked him, how many Greeks here? And he goes, oh, there's plenty. He says, Charlie Cordes at the Seven Seas, uh, Papa Chris at the Carolina Cafe, Alice Caritas at the Seaside, he started naming, you know. There was about 11 Greeks here, 11 Greek families. So we counted up there 11 Greeks. It's amazing. There were 1,500 people here when we stopped. 1,500 Myrtle Beach. By 1950s, 3,500. So I mean, it was a, a tiny town, so everybody knew everybody. At Christmas, you go to Chapin's, every face in there is familiar. You knew everybody, you know. But there was 11 Greeks. Now, there was seven or eight Lebanese here. Our landlord was Lebanese. And my dad spoke good Arabic, and he never told him that. 
and he used to come in sometimes with other Lebanese speaking Arabic talking about my dad and years went by and I remember one time a party of seven came in and uh, in Lebanese they're talking and the check came and my land my dad's landlord says put your money away I never pay here and my dad says in perfect Arabic tonight you're going to pay <laughs> and I remember I was sitting there I was about 12 and he looks up and he says you speak Arabic he says yes he never told me he says you never asked me <laughs> I worked at the pyramids for a uh, 10 months uh, I speak good, good Arabic and he said that from now on you're gonna pay and I thought okay good <laughs> yes sir smoke play or cigarettes we had he learned that in uh, England and uh, I had to order them and we go to the bus station I'd pick up a, a carton with about 200 packs in it they were hard pack play or cigarettes you're right that's a good memory yeah he smoked he smoked till he was 86 uh, and when he was 90 smoking finally killed him <laughs> Yes, so it's Ruben over here. Yeah. Murphy Cohen was a, uh, he owned a liquor store, and uh, he finally quit drinking and sold the liquor store and became the distributor of the Charlotte News, was it? The Observer. And he taught me, he and Tony Curry, another Lebanese guy, who carried brass knuckles in this pocket and a rubber hose full of sand in this pocket and he was a very dangerous little guy he was a collector and he was a collector for a, another Lebanese gentleman anyway he he and Murphy taught me how to say crap in ten ten languages when I was six years old and I could rattle it off and my mother would cross herself and sprinkled me with holy water. She thought I was going straight to hell. My dad and all the kibitzers would laugh. I can only remember five or six of them now, but but uh, they would give me a silver dollar for that. You know, every prostitute has their price, and that was mine. <laughs> I'd do anything for a silver dollar. <laughs> but that's a good memory. Dad, dad was a hunter too. He loved he loved riding down there. And Yeah. Uh, you didn't know her well. <laughs> Mom invented the filibuster. <laughs> See, uh, I'd get thrown out of the Broadway theater for doing some terrible things. Mom would go down there and start yelling, and they'd finally just everybody throw their hands up. <laughs> send him back, Angie. Okay, send him back. You know. They banned me forever. Mom come to put a movie was nine cent and penny tax back then, right? Right, ribbon. Yep. And a popcorn was five cent. Coat was five cent. If you had a quarter, you got in the movie. You had a baby Ruth. It was this big. You could beat somebody to death with a baby Ruth. <laughs> I mean, I'd carry one for a protection sometime. <clears throat> now baby Ruths are like this. It's a shame. Y'all have any more memories? Ladies and gentlemen, is he not incredible? I know we could be here for four or five more days listening to great stories, but many of the stories that Dino has are certainly in this book, Greek Boy, Growing Up Southern. Um, you know, this just reading that first page, as Dino asked me to do, reminded me I need to read this book again 
because I laughed and laughed and cried and laughed again. It is just phenomenal. If you haven't read it, this is it. That's my mom and dad there. Oh, He's sitting in the uh, dad's so sitting in the ocean forest marina patio having a really good drink. <laughs> the Brooklyn room. Yeah. No, that was in the green outside the green patio. Mom, I don't know where mom was here. That was them. And uh, tell you what, mom, you can't see this very well, but mom shows up. It's my second grade. How old are you, second grade? Seven? Yeah. It's my birthday. So she shows up with a photographer, cake, cupcakes, caters the whole thing, stops everything. And this picture, everybody's dressed like little urchins. <laughs> they look like the damn maitre d. She's got a white shirt and a damn jacket. I stand out like a chandelier. <laughs> and this is Mrs. Bradford's kindergarten. And uh, that's me up there. That's Dr. Grant's son. P.G. Winstead. That was the, the Winstead that owned the funeral home. Went and got Uncle Andrew. These <laughs> were all the kids. I finally met some rich kids. You know, we thought they were rich anyway. They were <laughs> Well, this is Sun Fun. This is me and the old man in front of the coast corner. Back then, he had to wear shorts during Sun Fun. So my dad didn't wear shorts much, but back then, they arrest you and put you in that bamboo jail. You <laughs> <laughs> didn't have shorts on. So here we are standing there. You can see the, the little flag back here. Sun fun flag. That cozy corner's right behind there. And this is the writing on the window. You can see Chinese. We had Chinese food. We had a menu with 200 things on it. <laughs> I don't know how we got it. I think we all need to go to Flamingo Grill and buy a copy of Cluster Forks. Yes. So Dino will be up here if any of you want to come up and talk with him personally. We thank all of you for being here. And do know that in January, we have Victor Shama. What is the date? The January 11th. 11th. Right here in this room, Victor Shama. Um, has been with the Bowery since since he was about four or five too, um, and he's got some great stories about not only growing up here uh, but also the ethnicity, his issues, and then of course he wants to talk about Alabama and what they did at the club. So that'll be another great program, January 11th, and that'll be two o'clock here at the library. And thank you, Jennifer, for setting up this series. Let's hear it for Jennifer. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, librarians. So come up and shake Dino's hand, give him a hug, and we thank you, Dino Thompson. Thank you. Oh, I could listen to him for 20 years. He said to me earlier, I don't want to go home. I do have to go to the restaurant.